Hey everyone, it's Blake here with ChessPathways.com, and today we're going to be talking about the Philidor Defense. The Philidor Defense can actually be reached through a couple different move orders, we'll be talking more about that later in this video, but for now, let's consider the Philidor Defense to begin with e4, e5, a symmetrical king's pawn opening, white plays knight to f3, and now instead of playing the main move knight c6 defending the pawn, or knight f6 the Petrov Defense counterattacking the pawn, black simply plays d6 here, and we end up with this position. Now, the Philidor defense isn't as popular today as it once was, partially because knight f6 and knight c6 are so popular here, but it's definitely a reasonable opening choice. It's more complex than a lot of people think it is. Both sides have a lot of options, so we're going to start taking a look at it today. In this position here, white almost universally plays this move d4, expanding in the center, creating some pawn tension, and opening up some more lines of development for the pieces. Even if white plays a move like knight c3 here, or bishop c4 and delays playing d4, they're probably going to play d4 in the next couple moves, just because it's kind of hard to find a rational plan here for white that doesn't involve d4. For example, you'll see some beginners play something like bishop c4, knight f6, knight c3, maybe black plays bishop e7, and white maybe just plays d3, black castles, and in the middle game when white starts asking what plan should I implement here, it's probably going to come down to opening the center with d4, so why not just do it in one move? Pretty much every grandmaster would always play d4 in this position. From here, one of black's possibilities is the exchange variation, where black simply takes on d4 and white recaptures with the knight. Not with the queen, because that would give knight c6 with the tempo, and the queen would have to move again, but this is one of the main starting positions here. Black can play knight f6, attacking the e-pawn, white defends it with knight c3. Black plays bishop e7 to finish up their kingside development and get ready to castle. And white has several options here. White could play bishop c4, putting that bishop on kind of its most natural square. The bishop could be a target on c4 for black's queenside expansion, possibly with c6 and b5 later on. But white can often play a4 to prevent this, so I pulled together a sample line to show how the game might go. Bishop c4, black goes ahead and gets castled, so does white. And now, sometimes black will play knight c6 and challenge this knight on d4, or sometimes black will just play c6 and start thinking about expanding on the queen side with b5. We see that black has a space disadvantage here in the exchange variation because white has the lone pawn in the center, but at the same time, black's position is very solid, black has no weaknesses, and black has fine lines to develop all their pieces on. This bishop and this knight can easily find a good square. So here white can play a4 and prevent b5. Black will often play a5 now and stop white from advancing this pawn further. And now after rook e1, improving that rook, black does the same with rook e8. White can play h3, trying to make this bishop have a harder time developing. And now bishop f8. This is a common maneuver known from a lot of king's pawn openings. This bishop gets out of the way of that rook and helps black add pressure here to the e4 pawn. White might pin this knight now with bishop g5, now that that bishop's out of the way. But black can reinforce it with knight b to d7. And this knight could even come to this nice e5 square here. So white will often get that bishop out of the way with bishop f1, knight e5, and we reach this position. Black could later think about trying to break down white's center with d5, or even still trying to play b5 and later b4, maybe after some preparation. White could play f4 here and chase this knight away and grab more space, but of course that's a little double-edged as well. That exposes the king a little bit, and this knight can just go to g6, and the game remains pretty complex. So that's bishop c4. Sometimes in this position, white doesn't put the bishop on c4. They might adopt an alternative setup where this bishop goes to f3 in some lines, like bishop e2 and later bishop f3. I'll pull a sample line illustrating this as well. After bishop e2, castle, castle, rook e8, white can now play f4 and grab some more space, and they want this bishop to come to f3, where it will not only defend this pawn, but possibly also exert its influence down this diagonal if white can ever get this e5 break in. So black once again plays bishop f8, moves that bishop out of the way to generate some pressure here on e4. White's just in time to defend it with bishop f3. And now black can play c5 and drive away this knight, and after the knight moves, now this knight finally develops to c6 when there's no exchanges possible. After something like rook e1, black even plays a5 here sometimes, trying to drive this knight further away with a future a4. And both sides are just left to play a middle game from here. For example, white can play a4 to prevent this threat, but now that kind of surrenders the b4 square, at least for now, to black, and black can play knight b4. And black can look to play bishop e6 soon and complete development. So we've been looking at this exchange variation. I just want to show one more line before we move on. 
After black exchanges here on d4, plays knight f6, knight c3, some players with black will even adopt a Fianchetto setup here with g6, so this bishop can be a lot more active along this diagonal than it is sitting on e7. But when black goes for this, and I have the white pieces, I'm often tempted to go for the same attacking setup we see in the Sicilian Dragon, where white can simply play bishop e3, queen d2, castle queenside, and launch a big attack here on the king side with their pawns, and possibly play bishop h6 later to exchange off that bishop. And because of this, I would actually consider this setup to be pretty dangerous from black. White can get a big attack in a lot of lines. I'll pull one sample line here as well. For example, bishop e3, bishop g7, queen d2. Again, simply preparing to castle queenside, or to play bishop h6 to exchange off this bishop. After castles, white can play f3, not only taking away the g4 square from the black pieces, but also this pawn can serve as a launching point for white's kingside attack. It allows white to play g4 safely. Knight c6, white castles, black could, for example, exchange here on d4, but that's not really going to get in white's way very much. Bishop e6, g4, c5, black's trying to get some counterplay here on the queen side. Bishop e3, queen to a5, and now bishop h6, exchanging off this good defender of the king here, and making way for possibly h4, h5 later. Black's attack, meanwhile, is not so fast. It's kind of hard for black to get enough play here. If black, for example, takes this pawn right now on a2, tactically this does not work out so well for them. White can play bishop takes g7, king takes g7, knight takes a2, queen takes a2, and black's threatening checkmate. But after queen c3, it's actually black who's in trouble. g5 is a threat that's very hard to stop. If h6, then just h4, of course, and black's actually going to lose a piece in this line, and white's completely winning. I suppose black could try g5 to avoid losing a piece, but this looks completely suicidal, opening up the h-file. h takes g5, h takes g5, there's even rook takes d6, and it's clear that black is busted. Okay, we've taken a look at the exchange variation of the Philidor. Now let's take a look at what's called the Hanum variation, where black does not take on d4. And I'm going to show you a different move order black can do to achieve the Philidor defense. Black sometimes starts with d6 here on move 1, and after d4, knight f6, and it looks like black's going for a Peart's defense with g6, but after knight c3, now black can play e5 in this position, or sometimes even knight b to d7 and then e5, but e5 here is more popular, and it looks like this allows white to exchange queens if white wants to. White can take here on e5 and take on d8, and now black can't castle, but without queens on the board, that's actually not such a big deal, and black actually does okay in this position. White's advantage here is actually pretty minimal. So after e5, a lot of players won't go for that endgame, and they'll just play knight f3, and we end up right back in a Philidor defense, just as if black had played e5 and then d6. And here, again, black could take on d4 and go for the exchange variation, but also black can play knight b to d7, and we end up in the Hanum variation, where black is not so quick to relinquish their strong point here on e5. So in the Hanum variation, white usually plays bishop c4, just developing that bishop to its most active square, we're going to come back and take a look at a more exciting alternative white has in that position, but bishop c4 is the main move. And now bishop e7, black simply finishes up their kingside development. Castles, c6, threatening to expand with b5 and b4, so white often plays a4 here to prevent that. And now black gets castled. In this position, rook e1 has often been played. Uh, white can also just play h3 here to prevent black from possibly bringing a bishop or knight to this g4 square. Now it looks like black can play the famous center fork trick here, with knight takes e4, knight takes e4, and d5. Black sacrificed a piece for a pawn, but they're going to get a piece back for a pawn. But Grandmaster Negi actually came up with a fantastic idea in this position that I got to use once in a tournament game. White can play here rookie one. White's going to lose a piece back anyway, so why not just let black pick? And after, for example, d takes e4, rook takes e4, e takes d4... And instead of recapturing right away, white can play bishop f4. And if black were to reinforce this pawn with c5 and try to stay up a pawn for good, now queen e2 is very strong for white. This bishop has a hard time moving. If the bishop moves to f6, for example, then bishop d6 looks like it's going to be a problem for black. So that's one option here after castles. The center fork trick here with knight takes e4 is definitely nothing to fear, but you can also just play rook e1 and prevent it altogether. And here black will often play b6, giving this bishop a nice square to develop to, and after, for example, h3 and a6, this really illustrates well the complexity of the Philidor defense. 
Black is here not really committing any of these pawns yet. Black might later play d5, black could later play b5, and the black position is really solid here. The pawn structure could change here in any number of different ways. For example, if white took here on e5, we would end up with this open d file, or we could get a much more locked center after white plays d5 and black perhaps responds with c5. Now the pawn structure almost resembles a Benoni defense, which isn't even a king's pawn opening. White has the central space advantage, but black's probably going to try to expand with b5 and get these queenside pawns rolling. Coming back here to the starting position of the Hanum variation, I said bishop c4 was the main move, but I promised to come back and look at an exciting alternative. White can also play this surprising pawn sacrifice g4. This is called the Shirov Gambit. Grandmaster Shirov is of course famous for playing g4 in all kinds of opening positions where it was never before thought possible. And this can actually be pretty effective. Black can easily fall for some traps here. For example, one of the ideas is knight takes g4, now rook g1, just putting this rook on an open file. Black retreats with knight g to f6, and now bishop c4. White would like to perhaps play knight g5 here and really target this weak f7 pawn. And notice how if black tried to play bishop e7 so that they could castle next turn and defend f7 with their rook, that doesn't work out so great because after bishop e7, white could simply take the g7 pawn. Now we see why that rook is useful on that open file. So instead, after bishop c4, black can play h6 to stop knight g5, but of course that's another non-developing move that black has to make. Bishop e3, black could play c6 here. Again, it's kind of hard for black to finish their kingside development with this rook on g1. And now white can exchange on e5 and play this funny looking move queen d3, which has a hidden little threat. Black usually plays b5 here to prevent this threat, but I'll show you what happens if black does not play b5. If, for example, black plays queen c7 here, just a normal looking development move, now white can actually take on f7. Bishop takes f7, king takes f7, queen c4, and black actually has no good way to deal with this. White is essentially winning. For example, king e7, knight h4, and it's really hard to stop these threats of knight g6 check and knight f5 check, and black's development is a total mess. So the main line continues here with b5, denying this queen access to the c4 square if white tries to sacrifice on f7. So instead, bishop b3, queen a5, but now white can castle queenside, and we get an exciting attacking game. So that was the Shirov gambit. Let's come back and look at the Philidor counter gambit, which is one of Philidor's original ideas when he was coming up with this opening. After e4, e5, knight f3, d6, d4, we said that black usually exchanges here on d4 or goes for the Hanum variation, but this move f5 looks reasonable at first glance. It's defended by the bishop, and if white were to take on e5, then black could simply take on e4. So this looks very logical to grab space like this at first glance, but unfortunately for black, this line is considered just about refuted these days. White's best move might simply be knight c3, just defending this pawn, and we see that white is up in development, white has two pieces developed to black's none, black has exposed the king's diagonal here, white is threatening to take on e5 next turn now that their e4 pawn is defended, and if black tries to make good on their positional threat to grab the full center after, for example, f takes e4, knight takes e4, and d5, this can go really bad for black. White has the great move here, knight g5, and it's surprisingly already very difficult for black to defend this position. If black played h6 here trying to drive the knight away, then white has a fantastic blow here, knight to f7. And the attack's just going to be overwhelming. After, for example, king takes knight, knight takes e5, the queen's coming to h5, and this king's never going to be safe. So going back here to this position, if black doesn't play h6, if black were to play something like e4 here, trying to attack this knight and grab more space, white once again has a really nice blow here. White can play knight e5, threatening knight f7. This already looks very bad for black. And after the forced knight to h6 to defend f7, now knight takes e4 is very strong, threatening to remove the defender here, play bishop takes knight, and that would force this pawn to come to h6, and then queen h5 is a decisive threat. So this move f5 cannot be recommended, but it's nice to know how to play against it as white. I would recommend playing knight c3, and you're likely to get a very good position. Finally, let's just talk a little bit more about this move order issue. I mentioned there were two different ways to reach the Philidor defense with either e5 and then d6, or playing d6 on move 1 and playing e5 later. And you'll notice that when we were talking about the exchange variation, we had black play e5 and then d6. And in the Hanum variation, we started out with d6 on move 1, going for this Peart's defense move order with d4 knight f6, and only later playing e5. 
And it turns out there's a reason for that. If black wants to play the Hanum variation and not take on d4, they probably should play this move order and not the one with e4, e5, and I'll go ahead and show you why. So after e4, e5, knight f3, d6, d4, if black wants to avoid taking here on d4 and they want to go for the Hanum variation, then they have to play either knight f6 or knight d7 here. So let's look at both. If black plays knight f6, white does not have to transpose to the Hanum variation with knight c3 here defending the pawn. White could instead take here on e5. And in this case, the queenless middle game is not harmless for black. Black would actually be in trouble there. If black took back on e5, white can exchange queens, take on e5, and black does not have time to take on e4 because knight takes f7 is a threat. White is doing very well in that position. So instead, going back after white takes on e5, black can't take back. Black has to take the e4 pawn, and now white can play this move queen d5, and this knight's almost trapped. It can only go to c5, and now white can play this very annoying move bishop g5. And black can go for this if you want to, but it's considered an advantage for white. Here, for example, after bishop e7, white can just take here on d6. And now, if you take back with the bishop, you lose the queen, so you can't do that. If you take back with the pawn, now you have an isolated pawn for no reason here on the d-file. That's going to be a big target after white puts a rook on that file. And if you take back with the queen, then after knight c3, the pawn structure is symmetrical. But white has a nice lead in development here. White's getting ready to castle long. And white has a phenomenal score from this position. So that was knight f6. On the other hand, if you play knight b to d7 here, now white does not have to play knight c3. White can play bishop c4 right away and not waste that tempo with knight c3 because you never attacked their e4 pawn. And here, if black were to play knight f6 and try to get their favorite setup, now they have to worry about knight g5 because of this early bishop c4 move. And black can try to play this. Black could try to sacrifice a pawn here with d5, which is really their only move, but this is, again, considered pretty pleasant for white. So in this e4, e5 opening move order, that's why most players here play the exchange variation. And if you want to play the Hanum, you should go for the d6 setup, only playing e5 on move 3. Finally, to wrap up, let's just talk about a couple other options in this position. We've said f5 is definitely bad. We've talked about the downsides of going for the Hanum variation with knight f6 or knight d7. We've said that e takes d4 should be the main option here in the e4, e5 setup. Now, black also has a couple other moves. Black could play knight c6, which looks totally reasonable. It's just not really a Philidor defense. White can play bishop b5 and go for the Steinitz variation of the Roy Lopez, because once again, this, uh, this bishop's pinning that knight to the king. We just transposed to a Roy Lopez. There's also lines that would transpose to the Scotch game. So if black wanted to put that knight on c6, they probably could have just done it last turn. So usually when black plays d6 and goes for the Philidor, they're not looking to play knight c6 on move 3. Finally, after d6, d4, this move bishop g4 used to be played a lot. But there was an extremely famous game played by Paul Morphy back in the 1800s that just about refuted this line as well. It looks logical to pin this knight, but after white simply takes here on e5, it looks like black doesn't really have a good choice here. If black takes back that pawn, now white gets to break this pin of their knight by exchanging queens, and black simply loses a pawn, so that's no good. So after white takes here on e5, black really has to take on f3, but that's not really so great, just giving up a bishop for a knight like that for no real reason. And after queen takes f3, d takes e5, bishop c4, white's ahead in development, white has the two bishops, and white's already threatening checkmate here on f7. And that game famously continued with knight f6, queen b3, where black's in big trouble. b7 and f7 are both hanging. Thank you very much for watching this video on the Philidor defense. And please make sure you visit chesspathways.com and get signed up. I'll go ahead and put a link down in the description. It's totally free to get signed up, only takes 5 seconds. And when you do, I will send you a free move-by-move -move guide to chess thinking. Thanks, and I'll see you there.